So <clears throat> you've used four techniques. Uh, and for the specific issue that you were working on, of the four techniques, which was the most helpful? Yes? ABC. ABC was the most helpful. Why was that? Because um, I think it, we do tend to get, I think it allows us to kind of see both sides of mm, things. Okay. Um, we don't, I don't, we do that in coalition. Great. So because ABC forces you to look at positive and negative, look at both sides of the equation and acknowledge that both exist, if your group is having a hard time being balanced, this can be a helpful technique to correct for that error in just assumptions and thinking. Great. Others, yes? Yes. Um, you could group them into major categories. Yes. And then really, you know, drill down into each of those major categories. One of the things we find is that in the five whys technique, and we'll take um, this one. I don't even want to point to mine. It was so ugly. Um, this one's nice. Um, <laughs> is that you will find issues showing up in multiple places. Now, the value here is in brainstorming, get the ideas up. Don't, don't overthink it at the moment. It's brainstorming. Get them up. But people start recognizing that there are common causes in places they didn't expect and at different levels. And they'll appreciate interrelationships more in the five wise technique than they would in others that might separate those things and not show those causes. Yes? Question. Yes? A lot of times in the five wise, it seems like if somebody has something very specific, such as most of ours start out with big risk factors, and if mm -hmm. they have something very specific, somebody knows their community very well, and they say it's Bob at the convenience store selling alcohol, right. it starts out very specific. Right. What, where does that go? Yeah, thanks for reminding me. We talked about that question um, at your table. One of the nice things that, that I've discovered in the five wise technique is if someone starts too specific, and you'll, you'll find this happening actually in your coalition. Someone comes in and it's like this thing. They're on it. They're not letting go of it, right? We're going to work on that thing. That's the real reason. And it's like, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> if it's very specific, five wise will force them to start appreciating the broader. If they keep asking why of, the 7-Eleven on the corner that's not carting. Well, why aren't they? They'll start getting to more general causes, and it'll help them get off that specific and see the generality. Conversely, just because of the nature of the way five whys work, if I'm starting very broad, it's going to make me narrow. It's going to start me breaking it apart. So we have people come in and sort of just sort of glib and broad ideas. Well, you know, we just need to kind of do this thing. Well, wait a minute. The five whys will help them become more specific. So interestingly enough, no matter whether I start too specific or too broad in the first set of whys, the five questions, the five whys, tends to correct for that, and that can be helpful. Thanks for reminding me about that one. Yes? I like the triple W's because it really helped you take a big general problem and then break it down to specific actions that you can take to address rather than just shooting a you know, mass. Universal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can target in on where the problem is occurring. Specificity is your friend. Yes. And see what What's really, what yes, and and so if your current surveys don't ask questions like when, and where, and were adults present, those might be really helpful questions to add to your student surveys to better understand the context for behavior, and maybe be more precise in your interventions. Good. What else did you like? Yes. I I have to say it depends on what my goal is for the, the yes. next. Yes. Because if I was if I'm doing uh, thinking about how I'm going to do like a message map or communications, the ABC is perfect. Uh -huh. It's kind of it's got the argument, the counter argument. Yeah. There. But like overall strategic planning, I guess I'm just the disciple of the Keck Institute. But like the the regular old root cause yeah. analysis is what that is where I can see interventions tied to. Mm -hmm. I think the others is more for um, kind of getting everybody on the the same page. And I think that the five W the Y's get us here deep in why why <laughs> <laughs> like a nightmare. Yeah. Like yeah. This one where I think it, it, Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So, well, go ahead. I was kind of mine's it's kind of along the same lines in that I could see using this each one with a particular group. Mm -hmm. like yeah. My, law, my law enforcement are going to like um, the grid better uh, because that's the kind of data they collect. Yes. When, where, and why. Um, maybe not so much the why, which I think would open their eyes into. Oh, we have a serious concentration here. Maybe we need to look at why mm -hmm. we haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. So I can see that being very specific to to a a discipline or a particular group in the species. So I could use it in a in each one in a in a particular group. Great. So 
think about the things we're ruling out here and ruling in as to when we use the various tools. And I just want these to be tools in your toolbox that you pull out on the right occasion. Depends on the group I'm working with. Turns on the aim I have for why I'm conducting the activity, right? They can be sequenced to counteract certain weaknesses or strengths, right? Or earlier we were just talking about my group is so used to one technique, they've lost even really the ability to be creative in its use, and they just need to use a different technique for another reason that is different to make them think again, right? Even though it may not be the optimal one, it would serve that purpose. So it absolutely is context dependent. And this is why I want you to have multiple tools. We, we recommended to CADCA when we wrote the, with the Coalition Academy curriculum, right? We recommended the, the, the why and why here technique for all the reasons you've just named, right? In terms of its, how it integrates this current prevention science, where in typically data rich environments, it's very well suited to some of the strategic planning. It leads us directly into modeling and selecting interventions, right? So it was the most generically often true and best one. So we selected to teach it as the emphasis. And we ask people to do it in the academy and in other coalition trainings from CADCAD for that reason. But sometimes we then presume it can always be the right tool. And here we're just trying to appreciate the variety of tools we've got, so we use it at the right time, or we expect the right things from it, and then it's even more powerful. I saw another hand. Yes. I just want to talk about the, um, the five whys. We, I learned it in an organizational kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So like, why are our coalition members not coming? Why? Ah, yeah. Like, why? Why? Like, yeah. So sometimes it's good for more like organizational yeah. Oh, we've borrowed many of these yeah. from uh, systems analysis tools, right? If you Google up the social analysis, right, or group analysis of social issues, you get like nothing. We've had to make these things up and borrow them from business and process management and continuous quality improvement and these kinds of things, right? And Six Sigma, we borrow it from all these places and ask how do we adapt them for the purposes of getting shared understanding, for the purposes of, of bringing about clearer understanding, right? And so borrowing from behavioral analysis for ABC, right? And old school community organizing for five Ys and failure modes and effects analysis, right? And these kinds of places we had to go to find these tools and bring them into this place because there is not one guidebook out there for the community organizer that says, hmm, I've got 25 people with a whole lot of different assumptions about the same issue. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> I got to get these people on the same page. I got to figure out which of their assumptions are any good and which of them are nuts. I got to do it in a way that's group appropriate. Right? So people are, feel free to put their ideas in. And then I've got to turn this into a platform for action. And I've got to do this all the time. It's like one of the hallmark things community organizers have to do. Name the issue. Whether we're being specific, drill down to the organizational level, why aren't people coming to our coalition? Great, grab an analysis, let's think it through. Or whether we're really broad. Oh my gosh, we've got an emerging drug trend. What do we know about it? Why is it even starting? It's just routinely central to our role in effective community organizing. So let's talk about this. Let's, this is a really important point. When we are in substance abuse prevention specifically and problem behavior reduction generally, our orientation is to focus on the negative and try and reduce it. All right? But we should always be doing it in the context of positive youth development and whole family support. We're going to talk about this a lot tomorrow. Kids aren't problems or issues. And treating them about one problem or one issue is to completely miss the context of youth development. These things happen in the context on a second, of not only the immediate presenting behavior, but in the notion of lifespan development. Basically, we're trying to raise healthy kids. And one of the fundamental threats to that is substance abuse across so many dimensions that we legitimately organize on it. But when we lose that frame, we stop being child-centered and we start being issue-centered. And that is a trap. That's a trap that will prevent you from getting outcomes. Now, this is not an argument that one should view it positively or one that should view it negatively. One should view it holistically. That's the answer, and it includes both of those. What problem behaviors do we need to reduce? What's the affirmative? That, why, do we, we, why do we care? Because it's a threat to the things young people want or that we desire for them. What are those things, and have we named them, and are we assuring that they're occurring? Right? These things work hand in hand. Whether, like a state like Kansas that uses the CTC model, or Washington, or Pennsylvania, or New York that have been very heavily involved in communities that care, or whether you're using an assets-based development approach and understanding and lens, these are equally helpful. Or the Institute of Medicine put out, what are the features of positive youth development settings regardless of where you are? Whether you're at a park or at home, what are the universal features of positive development settings for youth? We can name what they are. We can diagnose what it looks like in our community. We can assure that they're present. Right? There's a lot of these things that are important, and one of the things that are helpful for us with these initial models, especially when we're new to the field. I mean, how many of you trained to be a coalition director in college like that was your career ambition? <laughs> I never get a hand to that question, right? We all came to this field of work from other things. They may be similar passions. 
or parallel skill sets. Right? We bring great, great experience in this space, but it's not what we set out to do. It's only becoming and emerging to recognize as a skill set instrumental that we need and that people are in school for these days, which you know, I think is awesome. Right? But because that's the case, we come in and we have to learn a whole way of thinking. And often those initial models were extremely helpful to us, whether they were CTC or America's Promise or Search Institute. These are extraordinarily valuable ways to bring science and understanding into your community. But then as we mature, we begin to recognize that there are multiple models and we start becoming very community centered and we integrate the strengths of them and we think about them more broadly, right? And so that initial ladder that got us into being more effective, <laughs> bringing science into our community, <laughs> having a language for this, what do you do anyway? Oh my gosh, right? becomes then a springboard to a more sophisticated understanding. And then these kinds of tools that help you integrate and bring community understanding into them become all the more important to you. One of these things that we do in any field is the bright, shiny object. This year it's circles, next year it's squares. Then it's popular to be purple, I don't know, whatever it is, right? And there are very important and helpful innovations that come to us that we need to incorporate. But we often don't incorporate it, we leave behind and do the new instead of adding it in, right? Wonderful things being understood around positive social norms and social norming, these great things, right? Good evidence behind them that we can incorporate into our approach, but often we just leave whatever we're doing behind and do the new thing, right? Rather than building a more sophisticated and complete repertoire each time as we learn and find these. That's hard to do, I know. We don't have enough money, we have staff turnover. I mean, it's very hard to do, but idealistically, we would remember this is about a whole child's life. It's not about substance abuse to them, it's about their life. That ABC analysis that took me into the consequence. It's about the consequence that I want and the choices I'm making and the context adults have created for me to make them in. Y'all remember Shannon Weatherly when she was a director at ONDCP? Remember, underage drinking is an adult problem with a youth consequence, right? Invariably, all these analytic techniques are designed to make it comfortable for the community to get honest about itself. Not about the kids, about itself and how it's raising kids. <clears throat> Our closing exercise we're actually gonna to do tomorrow morning. I'm gonna give you a couple of scenarios tomorrow morning and ask you to recommend a technique to a peer. What would you recommend to them if they called up and said, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, right? So we can think about that. And we'll use that as our launching point to tomorrow. Tomorrow we're gonna to talk much more, now that we've got these tools, some of them we'd seen before, some of them we're familiar with, but I wanted us to kind of be in the weeds for a day. Tomorrow we're gonna to talk a lot more about, now how do we sequence these? How could I really put together a good planning process that took advantage of several of these techniques? When are the next opportunities in my coalition to actually do these? When and how would I do them? How am I going to use this as a platform for linking and aligning the coalitions in my community that have an immediate, obvious connection? My teen pregnancy coalition, my substance abuse prevention coalition, right? My youth violence, my school dropout people, okay. Then we're going to have a conversation about common cause more broadly to act on this idea that it's the whole child. In the afternoon, we're going to focus in in particular on, are you currently connected to your out-of-school network? That network of nonprofit service providers who often offer most of the positive alternatives for young people? Are you well connected with them? And how do you make that happen? How do you find common cause with groups like that? Right? Because I see a lot of coalitions, when they think comprehensively, immediately think they have to own the whole map. How do you decide which parts of the map to keep? Which is your work and what's someone else's? We'll also spend a lot of time tomorrow about turning this into visuals that work. I joke often, my family's from Norway, we're Norwegian, we are lucky we look you in the eye, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Boxes and arrows and left to right work real well for us, but not for most people, <laughs> right? So we need to think very constructively, and tomorrow we're going to also parse out carefully that we don't fall in the trap of creating infographics. Infographics are not logic models. They serve different purposes, although they often come from the same source. So what are the differences and how do I know and how do I keep the value of what I need in a logic model? That's our topic for tomorrow. So we're going to try and use the tools from today in a lot of application tomorrow. And we'll start off with giving advice to a peer on which one they should use based on context and issue. Try to use sort of an icon with each one of them, right? The bubble chart, the waffle grid for the where, when, why. Uh, the ABC, the Jahari window, and then the five Ys we just did now with the target. Two that we're not covering, the storyboard technique and the narrative fishbone. I love the narrative fishbone. This is especially true when you take a catalytic event in a community, a young person who's harmed by alcohol, 
someone loses a life, someone drink and driving, right? Take that event, turn it into a storyboard, and you use a fishbone technique to ask what are all the things we could have done to have prevented this from happening, and just keep walking back in the storyline of the one example that has everyone's attention and turn it into a general understanding of cause and intervention opportunities, right? When we have those teachable moments, that can be a helpful technique because it's on people's mind, and it's very real, and they can recognize all the things we could have done or should do. Right? And that's, what, that's why it looks like a fishbone when it's done. It has all these off-ramps to it. Right? While a storyboard basically builds off of the notion that every story has the same thing. You have sort of the, set the general setting. It has a series of escalating events. Right? It has a catalytic or uh, the precipitating event that resolves it, and then the denouement of the story. Right? This is every storyboard author would give it to you. And this is done often by collecting individual stories from people and seeing patterns. So it's, very, it's a combination data collection process and analytic technique, but it's much more qualitative in its approach and the appreciation of the complex stories of people's lives and how you bring those out into a picture. So those are some techniques we're not covering in this class, but I wanted you to know there are more. You may hear about them right, as uh, so you bring up this issue or talk to peers about it. Another one you probably have heard of is the problem analysis triangle. If you ever work with law enforcement, they use the problem analysis triangle often as they think about criminal events and how to understand to prevent them in the future. Right? So you might encounter that would be another example.